This week, a special interview on Mags on Media with South African media entrepreneur Chris Becker, who spoke to interviewer Chris Gibbons at the recent Future of Media conference. The other big buzz phrase, content creation. What's your take on that? Is this the ad, the story, the media experience, the digital experience, all merging into one? Where are we going on that? Chris, that's a remarkably interesting question. When TV started in the 50s in the US, the typical soap opera was manufactured by the soap making company. So they commissioned the actors, they wrote the storyline and they produced it, then they gave it to the TV company. Over time, the feeling emerged that this creates a sort of a captive situation where the, the soap company has an incentive to oversell its product, maybe create unbelievable storylines to work in its own consumer goods. And the power moved to the, the network. So NBC would commission a team to create a soap opera, and then Procter & Gamble will place an ad inside this third-party created uh, content. Interestingly, now it's moving back because the consumer has found ways through technology of actually zapping our ads. There's a great incentive to work products back into the text, and the trick will be to do it without disrupting the narrative flow, to make it a good story and yet to work ads in. But it's happening, and you know in sport, because some sport is recorded and then played back and in the process the ad is lost. Just look at what your screen looks like. You'll have the Premier League or the local you know, Kaiser Chiefs versus Pirates game and then there's a squeeze back and an ad creeping in. Now that you can't edit out. So I think intrusion of commercial products into content is almost inevitable now that the consumer can, can zap at will. And the personal video recorder will increase this, I think, this trend. And where does big data, another buzz, buzz phrase, where, where does big data fit into all of this? I think the answer is we don't quite know. We know if you buy from us an awful amount about you, right? Not only what you buy, but also what you research. It's commercially useful, but socially ambiguous. Uh, just an example, I, I read a lot of history books. So if Kalahari detects that I have a love of this theme, and there's a new book about General Patton, and they toss it at me. I'm actually appreciative. It's directed at me, it reflects my taste, I like it. But let's say I have cancer. Kalari also knows it. Why? Because of the research I do, and think about what Google knows about you and what Facebook knows about you. If someone now starts selling me cancer treatments, I will quickly detect where this comes from, and I will feel it's a very severe intrusion on my privacy. E-commerce companies, uh, search companies and so forth know uh, an awful amount about the way my family is constructed, who has which problem in the household, who has which interest, who serves which sites. I think we'll, over time, find a way to extract the commercial element of it and make it more useful for the consumer, predicting his taste, for example, as we do in watching TV or reading books, but also giving a certain amount of privacy protection. And I guess the regulators are going to be active in this field. What about media mobility? You mean mobile phones? I do indeed, yeah. I think, Chris, that'll become the main form of communicating with the public, both for media companies and for advertisers. Just to give an idea, two years ago we had a classified business in India called OLX. It's the biggest such classified there. We had all our searches done on PCs. Now today, the business has grown to about 60, 70 million page views a day. It's gigantic. 70% of that's on mobile. And all the growth, you know, so every, every thousand users we add is on mobile. Soon it will be 80%, 90% of the service on mobile. But are all mobile consumers the same? Definitely not. And the quality of mobile advertising is often pretty poor. So contrast these two scenes. I'm picking up my newspaper this morning and I'm immersing myself in it for 20 minutes. The quality of my time is particularly high because I'm devoted to the newspaper, I'm looking at every page, I'm absorbing a lot of advertising, and I'm not distracted. But consider the position on a mobile phone. I pick up my phone because I'm getting a call. After that, I'm quickly checking a share price or a Facebook update. I spend a few seconds on this page. Anything intruding on the page is an irritant. So the quality of my time is really poor. The second thing is the quality of the audience. The newspaper audience tends to be 
somewhat older, high income, better educated, the quality of the mobile phone is everyone in the market. Every high school kid now has a mobile phone. So the quality of an advertisement placed in a newspaper and that appearing on a mobile phone differ completely. And as an advertiser, it's a tough call to make. You have to trade numbers with quality in terms of both attention span or int intensity of focus and quality of audience. And that's a tough call. Chris, let's bring it to globalization. Uh, you, NASPERS, operate in 130 countries. How does this all play? You know, I've been in ad agencies in New York, um, in Singapore, in London, Ghana. They all look the same. So the agency business globally, I think, is almost identical. And media people are finding the same. So when we as a company, as NASPERS, think about our competitors, we don't think Times Media or Caxton or whatever. We're worried about Facebook, Google, in the e-commerce space, we think about Amazon. So our competitors are global and it has a lot of implications. Take the regulatory scene. The regulator in South Africa still tries to create competition in every possible field. Well, if you compete with Google, you need the whole South African economy just to be a fraction of the size of Google. There's no way you can have multiple little Googles here competing with each other and then taking on global the global Google, which in any case is a monopoly in the States. So a whole regulatory scene will have to adjust to allow for a situation where such local players as survive the transition to digital has to take on the world. And that applies not only to media, but to advertising. So however you skin it, which, whichever angle you come at it from, globalization and technology are the key drivers. Indeed. And technology tends to be universal, but taste and content tend to be a bit local. So if you take, we have great success in super sport with the Premier League. That's an intensely local product which is unsaleable in America, right? But the technology we use to capture it is about the same globally. So you'll find that we use the same means to communicate, but the content of what we communicate is locally linked. So here's an example that the whole structure of Twitter is global. It's a quite a centralized company. But if you look at the content, it's in every possible language in the world. So in India, you'll have an Urdu girl talking to a Urdu boyfriend in Urdu. But the technology is sort of a global thing. Interesting, advertising has to span both. Not so, it has to understand the latest technologies, but it has to give it a local flavor to be able to sell effectively. This is an exclusive one-on-one -on -one this week with media tycoon Chris Becker, part three in a moment when Mags on Media continues. News that moves. ENCA.com.